I was embraced about four years ago by this anarch piece of trash who thought it would be hilarious to turn me after some Toreador said that they were going to do it. He skipped town, I got vouched for somehow, and so here I am. I'm grateful to be alive, but these politics, ugh. I try to leave that for the suit wearing stiffs. I only care about two things, my family and my music. My name is DJ Max Stylus, Clan Brula, and tonight I got the biggest gig of my life. Club Sepulchre, huge deal. Just gotta get there. Just gotta get there. What the hell is that sound? Oh yeah, right. Alarm. Good evening, Khalil. I don't know how you sleep through that alarm for so long. Let me get you some mana ish. La, shukran. I'm good. And we've talked about this. I don't eat regular food anymore. I know, you've said. But I just keep hoping you'll change your mind on that. Mama, I don't know what to tell you. Life is different now, and I won't be eating Manish anytime soon. Bah, it's just a phase. Yeah, but the next one is dust. Look, I love you, but I gotta go. I rush out the door and into the darkness. My set starts at midnight. That should give me enough time for clan check-in and still get there. But I gotta be quick. It's a new night and nothing's gone wrong yet. Win jump on my old ass Yamaha motorcycle and ride towards the meter spot. I'm a second generation Jordanian American by way of Dearborn, just outside Detroit. They call me a neonate because I'm new blood. But all that means to me is that I wasn't around to take part in the fight in 92 when the good vampires took Detroit back from the bad vampires. That's how it was explained to me, at least. If that's wrong, blame Roxy. She's the Bruja clan leader for the city, primogen to the prince, and a grade-A weapons-dealing badass. At least every other night, I'm supposed to go check in with her and catch up with everything I need to know about what's going on. As if I'm supposed to care. Anyways, I pull up to the Bikini Bar meeting spot to get this over with and get on with my night. Opening the door, I'm hit with the stale funk of sweat and desperation. Quickly, I see Kenny, Roxy's right-hand man. He's not a big guy, but I've heard he can more than handle his own. Of course, I heard that from him. There he is, the music man! You still disappointing your parents? Hey, nice to see you too, asshole. Work harder on your bait. It stinks worse than the flop sweat of your customers. Ah, you're no fun anymore. Hey, a bunch of the crew is gonna go out shooting later. You want in? Might kill something fun. Another time. Is Roxy out back? Yeah, you know it. Heads up. I think she's got a job for you tonight, too. Damn it. I push through the assorted bikers and person trash through to the back of the bar, down a corridor, and out the back door into a makeshift workshop set up in a garage. Smoke hangs in the air like a party guest that refuses to leave. Banging metal on metal with brief interludes of power tools revving drives sound waves deep into my head, making me uneasy even though I've been here countless times before. Not like I was going to get comfortable anyways. I see Roxy hovering over a workbench, checking every angle of a rifle she no doubt intends to get onto the streets pretty soon. I'd flash a little presence to let her know I'm here, but it wouldn't matter. She's intentionally making me wait it out, because she gets off on making people feel powerless. After what feels like a year and a half, she puts the gun down and looks up at me. Max! Surprised to see you. To what do I owe the pleasure of this visit? To our arrangement? Why do you always act so surprised to see me on these expected clan check-ins? Because I'm always shocked to see you keeping your word. There is no clan business that concerns you today, but I do have a personal task I need you to complete tonight. It's very important and very time-sensitive. So sorry, can't do it. I got a gig tonight. A big one. Club Sepulchre. Look at you. 
standing here all stiff, wearing a big puffy jacket with oil drum-sized headphones dangling around your neck, telling a primogen that you don't have time for a request because you've got things to do? You're adorable. You're really pulling the primogen card on me? As if you're proud of being the prince's attack dog, especially after he stood with that Ventru who's stepping on your turf? Oh, I get it now. That Ventru, Michael, he owns Club Sepulcher, and you're pissed that I'm playing there. You think far too highly of yourself, whelp. What you do on your own time is of little importance to me. Now, I have a package that needs delivering to a prospective new buyer. My crew is indisposed, so I need you to be the courier. Now wait a minute, I just talked to Kenny. They didn't sound like they were on some big mission. All of a sudden, I lost the ability to put words together. Roxy was glaring at me in a steely-eyed way that I had no power over. An inner voice in my head screamed at me to shut up and be respectful. As much as I wanted to tell her where she should stick her offer, I stammered a bit, then kept my mouth shut. If I may continue, I didn't leave with the best part. This is a big request on such a big day for you. How about if I absolve you of that minor boon you owe me? Or do I need to remind you of what would have happened on that lake had I not stepped in? I don't hate the idea of never thinking about that night ever again. And the delivery just has to be done by morning. So you should have plenty of time to get it done after your little show. You know what? Fine. Minor boon absolved and off the ledger for one delivery tonight. Done. Before I could even complete the thought, she had flashed over to a wall safe and pulled out a foot-long, suspicious-looking box wrapped in brown bags and tied with old twine. If he hadn't just been caught... I would have for sure thought that Roxy was secretly the Unabomber. Here's a name and a phone number. When you're ready, call and set up the exchange. Use the phrase, stab, stab, goes the murder of crows. I want to know if he's going to be a good buyer, so I need you to stick around and make sure he's happy with the goods before you leave. No problem. I got you on this. By the way, what's in the package? Roxy carefully and intentionally reached over and caressed the target dot scope of the rifle she's been working on in a way that told me in no uncertain terms to shut my big fat mouth. You know what? Never mind. I do not need to know and it's not important and I for sure do not need to know. I finesse my way out of there and back to my ride. Next stop is Club Sepulcher. It suddenly hits me that there's nothing more to do between me and there. I feel ready, but what if I blow it? What if they hate my music? What if I didn't put in enough work and they throw Molotov cocktails at the booth and I catch fire and burn to ash right there and expose the masquerade? Okay, that's unlikely, but maybe? Damn it, I need a distraction. I notice a working payphone on the corner and remember that I haven't checked my messages yet tonight. So I dial in and have just one to hear. Khalil, this is your mother. Just wanted to say how happy we all are for your big break tonight. We know you'll be great, but even if everything falls apart and you have the worst night of your life, it doesn't matter because we love you and are so proud of what you're doing. (laughs) Again, this is your mother, the one from home. Goodbye. Okay, that was awkward as a party barf, but no lie. It helped. I know I'm good, and I know I'm ready. So all that's left to do is get to the club and show them what DJ Max Stylus is all about. Welcome back to WCRG. It's rolling up on 2 a.m. here in the downtown Detroit area. Thanks for tuning in to Dark Skies, a late night show that goes bump in the night. I'm Jim Fisher. And I've got a caller here who had an encounter with the supernatural. Caller, you're on the line. Tell us what happened. It was crazy, Matt. I was having a smoke outside this bar when this sexy, tatted-up chick walks by, like, uh, like with purpose, you know? So I say, ah, oh, what the hell? I've had a couple, right? Might as well shoot my shot. So... I turn to her as she's right about to get to me, and she flashes me this look. And then... Then what happened, caller? Nothing. Nothing happened. I don't know what was going on, but I couldn't speak. I couldn't move. I could 
barely breathe. I stood there in silence while she just passed by. So you got nervous. You blew your chance. It's not such a big deal. It happens to everybody. No, it's not that. Every, every fiber of my being wanted me to tell her how good her butt looked in those leather pants. But uh, nothing happened. This beautiful woman cast a spell on me or something. It's the only thing that makes sense. So you think she was a witch that entranced you? Is, is that it? Jim, I don't know. But I was hoping of anyone in this city that you'd be the man to put it together. I got my own ideas, but <laughs> they're still formulating. Thanks for calling, and if anyone else out there has a brush with the unexplained or paranormal, hey, give old Jim a call. This is Dark Skies on WCRG. We'll be right back. I arrive outside Club Sepulchre, the underground vampire-friendly club that hides in plain sight. Anybody driving by would just see a chain hotel in a nondescript urban-style boxy building. But those who know make their way to the unmarked door around the side, down two flights of stairs, and into the cavernous underbelly of the club. It's dark, smoky, and loud. That is to say, a perfect spot for whatever we night monsters would like to get up to. I grab my case of vinyl off the back of my motorcycle and go inside. Pushing in a bit, I see Brutus. He's the club manager and also a ghoul to the Ventru stiff who owns it. You're here. Excellent. Given your reputation, I was starting to work. What the heck did I do to get this reputation? I don't know. Earn it. Anyway, this is my first dealing with you, and you're here, and I presume ready? Got my stuff right here. Just need a booth to get set up. Perfect. You're off to a good start. Right this way. I had about an hour till showtime, so after setting up, I grabbed a table in the darkest corner I could find. The club was kind enough to hook me up with one of their special elite beverages, so I wouldn't be hungry for the show. That was nice of them. As I sip and people watch to pass the time, a figure gracefully takes the chair opposite mine. No, seriously, it was like a leaf floating through the air off a tree and finding its resting spot, but like, the leaf was in the shape of a woman in a short black dress and combat boots. I don't see the point in picking the darkest place to sit when you're wearing the brightest jacket in all of known creation. Hello, Tori the Toreador. One of the first vampires I met after I turned and probably the closest thing to an actual friend I found in my own life. If my embrace had played out the way it was intended, the two of us would for sure have been in the same coterie. Seeing her tonight filled me with both gladness and dread because it was possible that she was here just to support me, and equally possible that she was bringing something I didn't want into my life. Hey, I still can't believe your clan lets you call yourself Tori. There are no rules for us anymore. We are who we want to be. And right now, I want to be Tori. It's a little audacious though, isn't it? Hey, audacious is my middle name. <laughs> yeah. Wait, is it? It could be if I wanted. Do I dare to dream that you're here just to see my show tonight? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I had to be here tonight to see if you'd screw it up. <laughs> just kidding. You'll do great. And I promise you, you have my full attention. Till I don't? Till you don't. I suppose that's all I could have hoped for. It makes sense to have reasonable expectations. Suddenly, Tori grabbed the drink out of my hand with an unnatural quickness, took a swig, and returned it to my hand before I could blink. Ugh, you can't taste the anemia in that? Ugh. This place used to have higher standards. <clears throat> okay, good luck. And with that, she took her exit. Did she really taste something wrong with this, or was she just messing with me? Ugh, I don't even want it anymore. I finish the drink anyways, get up, and head towards the stage. Hey, handsome. You the DJ? Hey! You know who I am. No, I just guessed because you got a big patch that says DJ on your jacket. Then it worked. I'm Max. You staying for the show? I'm staying to find you after the show. Well, all right. Swing by backstage after I'm done, and we'll see what's up. See you there. Holy snap, this really is going to be the best night of my life. 
I get to the stage area, somehow focus up, and take my place. It takes me all of five seconds to immerse myself in the moment. I know my tracks are top level, my scratching is elite, and my wall of sound is nothing they've heard before. I'm one with the moment and every move feels natural. Every action is flawless. I am the music, the music is me. We are a single entity beaming with focus. The moment is pure. This is what I've been struggling to get. This is the high I have been chasing. I never want this moment to end. And in a split second, it does. I assume it's Tori right away. Nobody else I know can shoot that fast. The show's over. No point in lingering. I can send my cousin for my stuff during the day. When action like this happens, the smart choice is to get out quickly. So I throw my hood up over my head and join the masses trying to escape out of one of the back doors. I get to my motorcycle and sigh because unfortunately, that dumb package wasn't stolen. I rev my engine to cover the sounds of the wild and upsetting profanities erupting out of me. Take off into the night. Hey, got a package here. Stole to call this number to set up a special delivery. Oh yeah, stab stab goes the murder of crows. I hope I got the right place. Oh, <laughs> you have that package. Yeah, we are the ones who placed that bid. Look, it's a little late for people to still be up. We got a compound just north of the city if you just want to come by and drop it off. Yeah, no. I don't think I'm going to do that. There's a parking lot on Shelby a couple blocks east of Kobo Center. Be there in 30 minutes and let's get this done. Yeah. Okay. I'll be there. Look for a big pickup truck. Oh yeah, man. I'm totally going to pop over to your compound at 2 a.m. with a suspicious package. Ah, dang. He did say compound, didn't he? That means either militia or cult. Both could be a problem for different reasons. Ugh. I guess in a deal like this, it was never going to be Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Why would I be lucky? All right. I should have just enough time to hit up my contact around here and protect myself. This deal just got a lot more difficult. And here we are. Lily's Pawn Shop well known among us kindred as the place to go when you need a weapon quickly. It's really a well-honed racket because most weapons we buy from her get used that night, then ditched, then somehow end up back in her shop again the next night. At some point, somebody made her their ghoul, but nobody is owning it, and I don't care enough to dig deeper. She runs a pretty tight operation, so I'm surprised to hear an argument before I even step inside. A really young-looking girl wearing some sort of spooky robe is pounding on the bulletproof glass that separates the clients from the cashier. I wonder if she's one of those Tremere they keep locked away in that busted-ass Chantry building. Anyways, Lily is pointing at her with one hand, while the other grips a sniper rifle. Just another day in the unlife. Just sell me the gun already. Not gonna happen. What's even the problem? What's the problem? Blood needs explaining. You're a teenage girl with no ID in the middle of the night trying to buy a high-powered rifle. No way, no how, not gonna happen. Now get out of here before I call the cops. The kid is obviously a kindred. Well, obvious to me, I guess. I don't recognize her, but clearly she's got some power. She takes a step backward, raises up her hand, and her eyes start to glow red. I command you to give me the rifle, then forget I was ever here. Same with you, idiot. You will not remember this encounter. That's right. Figured I'd have the generational advantage over you, Neonate. Now, out of my way! Thankfully, the place is empty as I walk in, so I step right up to the counter where Lily is waiting. Oh, 
Oh, hi, Max. You preventing trouble or causing it tonight? Hey, Lily. You know, it's just another night where I don't want to die. Doing an exchange with some militia and I need some protection. Max, Max, Max. You're a good boy. Just go home. I know whatever this is, it's not your idea. Gotta do this one. Clearing out some debt. So you got anything that'll help me stay safe? You want some plate mail? <laughs> I'm kidding. I know you won't lose the jacket. Okay, I've got a Kevlar vest, some metal to wear under those jeans, and this rifle. Hmm. Weird. I know I had a rifle here a moment ago. Ugh, well, never mind. Here's a sidearm if you really get into it. I love the vest and plates, but I'm not into guns. Too much trouble. You got any, like, smoke bombs or something like that? Yeah, I got something. Easter eggs? I might need something that hits a little harder than that. These plastic eggs are set up so that if you break one, the elements inside mix and create a poison cloud that will envelop the area. <laughs> Perfectly fine for people who don't breathe. Really bad for those that do. All right, all right. But will they make smoke? I probably need lots of smoke. Sure, Max. We'll call it smoke. Okay. I'm in. Thanks, Lily. I've got to get moving. I put on the protective gear and hop back on my motorcycle. As I ride the couple blocks to the meetup, I start putting together a plan for how I want to set up the area for the exchange. I figure if there's any cars, I could put some of these eggs in my pocket on the windshield, so anywhere I go, I got access to some escape smoke. Yeah, makes sense to check the exit routes too. Make sure that I know each way to get in and out of the area. For that matter, where I station myself when they arrive is important too. Keep them in front of me. Make sure I got an exit to my back. Okay, I got lots to do when I get there. I pull into the lot and there's three pickup trucks with guys in camouflage pretend soldier gear already there. I guess it didn't occur to me till now that they could always show up early. New plan, let's just get this over with. You the guy? <laughs> Who am I kidding? You gotta be the guy. Hey, what's up, new friends? Yeah, I got the package. Who's got my money? I count five of them in three trucks. Moments like this make me wish I knew fewer people who'd cry at my funeral. One of the militia pulls a duffel bag out of their truck and hands it to my contact. Got your money. Right here. Let's make good with the package. I'm just gonna hand it to you. I give him the package and pick up the duffel bag. He walks it over to the pull down flatbed of one of the trucks. Not gonna lie, I'm real curious what's inside. If it's just drugs, I'm gonna be so disappointed. I watch as he pulls open the twine and unwraps the brown bags. Inside is an ornate box, but a foot long. He takes the top off and I can see what looks like the hilt of an old ceremonial dagger of some kind. I peer in for a better look when one of the other militia, wearing some kind of crazy goggles, walks with purpose up to my contact and whispers something into his ear. I can see his body language completely change after hearing what she said, so I'm ready to wrap this up. Okay, so you happy with that? We good here? You don't know what this is, do you? Come over here and I'll show you. I do not come over here in any way. You see, this is a very ancient weapon. It's called the Sengir Dagger. To any real person, it's just a normal ceremonial blade. But it's got some special properties to others in this world who would do us all harm. You know the kind. Only come out at night, drink blood. Uh-oh. And I can't wait to test it out when I find someone like that. What do you think? Two of the militia have come around each side of me closer than I'd prefer. I take a step back and they lunge to grab my arms. In the moment, I barely notice as the contact has drawn a custom Colt double eagle and aimed for center mass. I take two hits, one to each side, as the lackeys swarm in and push me to the ground. The contact stands above me, holding the dagger as the others pin me down. Creature are an abomination unto the Lord. It is well past.
last time that you die. <laughs> What's that smell? I realize in a flash that his shot must have punctured one of the eggs in my pocket. Time for me to push back. I call upon the blood and shove the militia member spinning me straight up into the air. Both shots this guy fired definitely got me, but the Kevlar was as promised and stopped the bullets from hitting home. I unzip the pockets of my jacket and a gout of gas starts pouring out, surrounding me in a dense fog. Hell yeah, Smoke! I grab one of the other eggs and throw it at the nearest shape I can make out. Another shot rings out and lands dead center in the middle of my chest. It's at this moment, something inside me breaks. Bruja are known for flying into a frenzy quicker than anyone else when pushed. And as much as I hate it, this is about to add to my unhinged reputation with the others. I grab the closest militia scrub and throw him towards a dumpster. Miss the dumpster, but good enough. I see one of the others choking and struggling with gas. So I bum rush him and push his body up against the side of one of the trucks. Smashing his head into the window, I can smell the blood, and it only pushes me deeper into the darkness. Turning around, the smoke has filled the area, making it difficult to see what's going on. I recognize a couple red dots in the fog and sprint to that spot. It's the narc with the goggles, of course, and she's not ready for all this, that's for sure. Quickly biting a chunk out of her neck, I spin around, heaving deep breaths, looking to find the next living thing and kill it. From behind, I feel a sensation that pierces my mind fog and my ribs. Die, monster! The blade pushes into my back and finds its way through the fibers of the Kevlar vest and makes its way straight into me. I feel the energy drain from my body instantly. I take a knee and then fall prone barely having the energy to make sure I land on my back so I can see. The militia leader, Ezekiel Ritter, holds the dagger in front of my face, showing me my own blood on the blade. He's wearing a gas mask, which feels really unfair. My vision starts to tunnel out, and I try to make quick peace with the fact that everything is about to end. You have no idea where your God is taken from me. Embrace death, abomination! But final death does not take me. With my remaining senses, I hear a hail of bullets puncture the night air. Ezekiel backs away quickly as I see a body fly and pieces of militia members pass from one side of my view to the other. As my body begins to descend into torpor, my mind casts away the moment and instead focuses with laser precision on how I'm disappointing my mother. You have so many people counting on you, Khalil. And you would let us all down by dying in a parking lot with your militia friends instead of fulfilling your promises to your family? <laughs> I'm just despondent that this is how you would treat your poor mother. Suddenly, I'm ripped out of the fog like I was falling from a bridge and the bungee kicked in. I come to and find myself drinking from a heavily tattooed arm. You back with us? Good. Now get off me. Roxy? Get your shit together. There was an explosion on the other side of town, so we have a hot minute to get moving, but not much more than that. I start to regain awareness of my surroundings. I see four dead militia bodies in the parking lot. At least, I think it was four. It's tough to tell with all the missing pieces strewn about. One of the trucks is gone, and none of the dead is wearing a gas mask, so I assume it was Ezekiel Ritter who got away. I sit up and start to gather my strength to stand, as Roxy picks up my motorcycle and casually tosses it into the back of one of the pickups still here. I can hear sirens in the distance, getting closer. Roxy leans down to one of the corpses, retrieves a set of keys, and starts up the truck she tossed my bike into. You got about 30 seconds to drink what you can here and get in, or I'm leaving you to field questions that we both know you are not ready to answer. Pull myself up, slurp up what I can, and race to the passenger side of the ride barely getting in as the truck lurches forward and away from the scene. Who were those guys? Vampire hunters from a local militia. Been on my radar for months. What was that in that package? Something called the Sengir Dagger. One hit and any one of us goes down for the count. Third question, what the hell? Your minor boon is now fulfilled and off the ledger. Now, let's talk about what you owe for saving you. 
I remove the threat and use my own blood to prevent torpor, and they were about to bring you to final death. I'll be generous and call it a major boon you owe me. A major boon? You set me up! You put yourself in a bad situation, and without me, you'd be dust. Now accept the boon and get out of my truck. You know what? Fine. I just want tonight to be over. Hey, wait! You still got my bike in the back of the truck! <sighs> At least I'm home before dawn. I wake up to the sound of purposeful banging on the door. I open it up. Khalil, there's a man. He's been here all day waiting for you. I, I think he knows about the thing. He says he has a message for you. What have you gotten caught up in now? Everything's fine, I promise. Let him in. DJ Max Stylus? Hey, yeah, that's me. Prince McMasters has summoned you to meet with him. Oh, okay, sure. When does he want to meet? Right now. Get yourself together. I have a car waiting. A surprise meeting with the prince. What's wild is, I don't know if it's about the club, the militia, or literally anything else. I clean myself up, throw on a less bloody jacket, and get into the car. Hey, I don't want to keep my fans waiting. A Vampire the Masquerade audio drama. Reclaim Detroit was created, written by, and edited by Ray Stacanis. Music and sound mixing by Sean Gould. Featuring Rama Valuri as DJ Max Stylus. Also featured in this episode, Emily Churchill, George Kaliotis, Philip Wilbur, Jonathan Coop, Ray Stacanis, Crystal Storm, Phil Ranta, Josh Marble, Jen Kane, Shakira Dunn, Sharmita Bhattacharya, and Rachel Kimsey. Portions of the materials are the copyrights and trademarks of Paradox Interactive AB and are used with permission. All rights reserved. For more information, please visit worldofdarkness.com. To learn more about the show, go to vampiredetroit.com, at vampiredetroit on Twitter, or email us. Vampire Detroit Podcast at gmail.com.